And then I'll have to press on the button here. Looks like we're on YouTube now. We're on YouTube. We're live. Hi, John. Hello, Jakob. How are you? Round 13 of the candidates. Um, I'm happy because it's still going on, and I'm happy because it's almost over. Yes, I, I feel uh, much the same way. <laughs> it's uh, It's been one of the better years of my life. I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should I quickly go through the games, and then you and I can uh, can talk afterwards? I think that makes a lot of sense. Good, let's do that. So... We'll probably, if you can turn off your screen and microphone, I think it will yep. work better. Okay, so uh, first game, Wang Hao against Kawana. Um, C3 Sicilian with A3 and Bishop D5. It's trying to force a, a draw against the Sicilian and essentially failing. So, okay. So here already here, there was a bit of back and forward here. You, like, um, and in all fairness, if he had continued doing that, uh, he probably would have been okay. But here, this is sort of a inexplicable uh, decision. Um, pawn, uh, give the opponent a, a pass pawn, very strong pass pawn. The idea that the d-pawn is going to be any, any good with the queen blocking it very easily on d6, I don't see. But okay, it's not a major thing. Maybe g5 was better. Okay, it's not so, so accurate play here. I think d5 is bad. The reason for that is at the moment, it can, the knight and the pawn they were together and controlling the squares in the center. And white should just try to avoid making weaknesses. Now black has the possibility of playing around him on the dark squares. Okay, it's a little tactic thing. And maybe white could have played like this. Black would bring a king in, see if he can do something, white should hold. But here, yeah, a little shot again, a little shot again. Here, no real reason to take an A on A5, but it's not major problem here. And here, okay, this was, was bad. Play king h1, bishop e4, and the pawn is just lost. It's sort of sort of a sad end for Wang Hao, but um, unfortunately, those of us who argue very strongly for the fact that a tournament like this should be through qualification and open for everyone, we have not been rewarded with uh, uh, with great role models for our course by uh, Wang Hao and, and Alexenko. Good, let's see the next game. Uh, Nepomniachi against Monsieur, uh, Maxime Vachier Le Graf. Um, G6 here. I don't know why. So if you play like this, this is normal, but here it's it's just a little bit strange. You know, this kind of uh, King's Indian to have the bishop on B7 is not very good there. And in this position, knight E8 to D6 is it just it looks bad, and whenever I try to do something like that in Blitz on various platforms, I get uh, get clobbered. And not surprisingly, here White is much better. He could take on d6, and the bishop in b7 would be buried. But he doesn't want any instability in the position. Let's uh, exchange Black's only good piece, and White is better. And the real moment of the game was here. Um, White had a chance to play c5, take, 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 knight b5, take here. Um, and he, he ends up pawn up. Um, I don't know why he didn't do it. Or with Nepomniachtchi, normally you would assume that he just didn't see it. He does play very fast and uh, uh, get, uh, governed by his intuition. Um, later in the game, uh, Shiel Graf sacrificed a pawn to get the knight into the game. Um, and yet, basically, they ended up in, in an endgame like this, where white is a pawn up, but the knights are so well placed um, that there's no advantage. So, um, 
Xengo against Englier, and this will be my game of the day. Um, I still have to write down my uh, my justification uh, for for why this is. And for me, it's sort of uh, symptomatic of the the tournament. This game, it feels like everyone has been playing chess for a year. And a lot of the players, when they talk about the tournament, it is like they have been thinking about it for a year nonstop. And, and this must have been very tough. So B3 against the Italian, it's uh, it's not a, around to stay. Um, okay, so total equality for black. Ding decided to uh, sacrifice a pawn, sort of martial style and get active bishops. Could play it in several ways. Here, maybe b6, c5, put the bishop on c6. I, I didn't like this uh, rook d5 he played. For me, it makes more sense to take with the pawn. And we could get some sort of position like this. It's a very typical martial thing. Strong d pawn. The extra pawn isn't, isn't very good. OK, the engine here wants to uh, go for, for this, which, which is a draw, but OK. Anyway, so here it was fine. I didn't really like how he was playing. Maybe why was it a little better? Again, here, bishop d7 and c5 and bishop c6. And the, the point of putting the bishop on c6 rather than f5 is if knight is on e4, we have f5 uh, pushes in some positions and should be good enough to, uh, to have full compensation. Um, here, there was a chance for some tactics lead to equality. Here also, uh, here there was a tactic with queen b1 also leading to, to equality and draw. Um, but sort of Geary was, uh, no, Ding Lian was was trying to win. And uh, here he had relied on this move, bishop e4. Uh, and uh, This combination just doesn't work. And this game is symptomatic for the tournament, I think. Uh, because here, after take, 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 and bishop e5, white has so many ways to keep equality. But he's also winning with the most natural move in the world, which is bishop b2. And after c5, he has this knight f3. And OK, if you take on d3, I take on e5. That's not a problem. And take. Check here, wins the game. This is uh, very basic tactics. And for me, it's uh, sort of symptomatic of the tournament that, that he doesn't play this. OK, so instead of this, he played bishop c5. And after rook b8, I don't know. You, you can guess at what he missed. But my guess is that he thought he could play like this. And here, bishop f4, and the queen has nowhere to go. Black wins the queen. So instead, he played bishop b4. Take, take, and here. And knight f3 and check. Bishop d4 and taking on on, uh, on f2. And OK, they played a lot of checks. Uh, some people were probably thinking that Wang Hao should have, have done like that yesterday. But it's a, it's a debate where we can Agree to disagree. Um, so yeah, this is not even if we had if we were at the Killer Chess Academy, the Killer Homework. This would be like one of the easy ones. Uh, Kushal is telling me here, Alexango took one and a half minutes for Bishop C five, and he had about half an hour. We've seen this in in many games in this tournament, where the players at critical moments are playing very fast. And uh, yeah, and we didn't get a press conference with uh, with these guys, at least not that I saw um, on the on the Feedy YouTube channel. So I don't know what what the storyline is. But usually they tell them, ask them questions like, "What did you have for breakfast?" and "Have you been sleeping well?" And uh, well, the last one is, uh, "Is there a lot of porn on your computer?" Uh, which luckily they were just asking each other. Uh, the commentator of the feeder channel. So it's uh, 
Uh, Robert is asking, maybe it's tough to adjust after online chess. Yeah, I, I, I will go with my normal story, which I think the players are focusing too much on openings and too little on being good at chess. Okay, the Geary game. So he played this uh, variation. Uh, normally you, you sort of play bishop a6 to provoke b3. So the, the normal way to play this line is bishop a6, b3, uh, bishop b7, bishop g2, check here and here. So here we get more uh, a variation that's sort of a similar to uh, the Boko Indian. And okay, it's a little better for white. The, the main difference here is if the pawn is on b3, you never get this open b line. And white was a little better, and at some point he could maybe play knight e3 to d5 was a little uncomfortable, or to f5. Um, maybe h4 here was a try for a win. If, if white took a pawn here, then uh, you can suddenly have massive compensation and take over the game. But in reality, okay, it was sort of uh, a little bit better for white. I've tried to play this with black myself. You can find it probably Danish championship playoff. Uh, it was like a daily playoff thing. Um, if you didn't didn't have a decisive game every day into the playoff, played it in the Danish championship of 2006 and I lost very badly and I've since not put my pieces in that way. Um, here uh, 97 which is sort of I think hoping to go to c4 or 5 or e5 and then here and take take it's not doing much and here white is better but how much we don't know but it turned out it was, it was a very quick uh, collapse. So I give this line here, which is really cool. I, it's by no means forced, but it's sort of like these kind of things. Um, sort of a black, maybe a little worse, maybe not. Uh, white can maybe play differently, but this knight c6 and queen e6. And then the knight comes to d5 like this. Uh, this was a, a true disaster for black. And then came a Queen d2, and he can't defend d6 because if rook e d8 comes g4, and he cannot not take, and he cannot take. If he not if he doesn't take, we take on h5, and look, it's it's, it's absolutely appalling. And here, for example, something like this just wins, like some discovered check or something, or h5, winning attack, and f6, h5, g5. And here, this very nice move, rook d5, take, take, limited where the queen can go because of knight checks. So we get all the pieces in, and it's a complete collapse. In the game, we played f5, but take, and it's all over, and he never recovered. Um, so a sad end for, for Giri. Uh, of course, it makes uh, Grischuk a little bit of a hero in Russia, but to be honest, he didn't play for uh, Nepomniachi he, today. He just played the way he always does, uh, normal chess, and chances came, and he took them. Uh, so there's there's no reason to uh, to feel otherwise. Against Nepo, he also played uh, his chances. But anyway, um, let me stop sharing, and let's get John back, and uh, he has a chance to gloat a little bit. So, John. Me gloat? Never. Never. So, who picked Kawana and who picked Napomniachi? Well, it depends on which video you watched. Yeah, because well, there was the one where I tricked you to having to <laughs> take Kawana. Um, okay. No, uh, I, um, I, my, my guy came through. I mean, I, you know, again, obviously, I would have liked to have seen Fabiano. I uh, came through. How secure do you feel in your employment with the U.S. Chess <laughs> Um. It's like 80%. 80%? 80, 80, yeah. And it was like a 90 or above that before this video. Exactly, yeah. I'm, I'm dropping by the moment. Um, no, I mean, it's it's going to be, I think it's going to be a very interesting match. I think there's, you know, they, they can they can make a story out of it. You know, the, the childhood rivals and, uh, you know, Napomniachi, who, if I'm not mistaken, worked for Carlson. 
uh, at so, some point in the recent past? So what I know, and you maybe know something I don't, but I know that they played this World uh, Championship on the 14 in, it will have been 2003? I, th that, I think that's right. I think it's 2003, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I think it's 2003. And uh, I played Carlson 2004, just after he became a GM. And uh, when Carlson was second and then Nepomniachtchi won, and uh, because of this tournament, uh, Carlson's mother never allowed him to play a junior tournament again <laughs> because he simply took it too badly. Uh. Um, so, but yeah, there was uh, one London Test Classic where Nepomniachtchi came and was Carlson's second. Um, but that's probably like a decade ago, at least. Uh, it was it was back in the days when Peter Heine Nielsen was the second for Anand, uh, mm -hmm. which he was until uh, early 2013. Um, so, yeah, what happened there was uh, I think most people know that Peter went to work for Carlson, but uh, as a an honesty thing, he. Uh, he helped Carson win the candidates tournament in London. And then as an honesty thing, he had nothing to do with the match against Anand in 2013. Uh, but in 2014, when Anand was a challenger, Peter was working for, for Carson there. But otherwise, he simply took a, a six months off from uh, nice. Carson. Yeah, no, but just, you know, you go from, from one guy to the the rival and, and they were like, okay, I cannot bring the the files I would this guy paid for me to to work on with me, yeah. Uh, so they, they have to be uh, a decent amount of time. Uh, Doc is asking, what are, was our friendly bet on this? Bracking rights. One point is a lot in a seven round event. Um, he can probably brack as much as he wants. I'm I'm not. A we, we we did say our our predictions were bad. Yes. Though your predictions were overwhelmingly good, but uh, I guess well, my, my, mine were less bad. We'll put it that way. Uh, or or uh, maybe they weren't bad. Mine was uninformed. It was just uh, me looking at the table and going, hmm. He has most points. That guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what I'll go with. He's at the top. Yeah. I, I remember a story about uh, a tournament in Thailand once um, where uh, a lot of players, uh, friends, they were standing there and you know, they were from far down the table. They were the, the fodder section. Um, and they were sort of say, okay, let's take a bet. Uh, last night, uh, you know, uh, we, someone has to, to pay, gets the worst position, and someone uh, has to get, uh, you know, some something you know, is Thailand. So you never know what they bet, uh, which cannot be said in, in front of children. I'll uh, do well if I'd say it, but... Um... Yeah, well, yeah. I don't think that was the bad, but uh, no, that wasn't uh, the best thing ever. No, but uh, anyway, um, so they were like choosing the the top ones. Like someone was like, "Oh, Vallejo, Gustafsson," and a friend of mine he pointed to a Chinese guy number six, and f somewhere from behind comes comes the voice of Nigel Short. Oh, you know him as well, <laughs> some some Chinese guy, not a professional. Who just won the tournament easily, of course. Mm. <laughs> not not a not a chess professional, but a very very good player. Um, so yeah, no, our bet was not in that category. I uh, I have to say I do think Karna really played badly. Um, See, this is interesting because if if you and, and again, this is where. Uh, I always like reading your your opinion and, and your take on things because it's quite often it's 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 heterodox. Um, you know the 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 Twitterati aside from yesterday, uh, they're, they're all saying oh, how great uh, Caruana played today and how how great his play has been and he's sh he's shown in this half of the tournament why he was the challenger in 2018 and um, I, I think your analysis. What is are they talking about? I mean, today, well, I mean, I guess today was pretty good, but but yesterday was just... Today was a good game. Uh, yeah. But to be honest, uh, there's not going to be a lot of opponents at this level who moved, moved the pieces back and forwards again and again. I don't think that's really a bar that uh, you should be 
worried about <laughs> jumping if you want to be number number one in the world. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I did want to ask you. Students should go back and check the legendary game between Ulf Andersen and Michael Bassman from Hastings 1973. Enough said on the topic. But no, no, the, the game from Carana today was fine. But Van Howe just collapsed. Mm. But but Kawana uh, didn't do anything. He he really didn't didn't do anything special. If, if, I did. Yeah. I, I did want to ask you about the the decision uh, by MVL to trade Rooks, um, because Today. as I was watching it, he you know he, he found a you know taking with a knight on c five and giving up the pawn on b six. Um, you know maybe it doesn't give him winning chances, but at least he gets play. And at least he he gets compensation, and then all of a sudden, he trades all the rooks and sucks all the life out of the position. Yeah, he, he <clears throat> trades all the active pieces. Well, at that point, he has the entire game been playing for equality. Uh, he decides to do it by being active rather than being passive. And in that moment, by removing all the pieces that can challenge the knight on c5, um, he, he basically just equalizes on the spot. But given is given the tournament situation, I mean, well, do we no say? <clears throat> okay, yeah, I, I guess that's it. Is that it's, there was only two players before today who could win? Um, the idea that somehow everything is going to realign itself, so that there's, you know, how many people have to die for MVL to be the challenger? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, no, no, I, there's nothing there. It was before today. It was two players, and uh, before um, Wednesday, it's one player. So that raises an interesting question: What do we expect tomorrow? Do we expect just? Uh, I think we expect a free day. Isn't that is true? the free day, or is I, I thought there was. I think there was like two free days: one the before second the second last round, one before last round. Uh, no, tomorrow is the last round. Oh my God! So. Uh, I'm actually, uh, I've told people I'm not available Wednesday night. <laughs> well, there, there will be no playoffs, so you will be... Uh... I'll, I'll be sitting watching Formula One, there but you not go. live, because that's also not Wednesday. <laughs> so so are, are, are we expecting just, uh, you know, handshakes as quick as we can get them tomorrow, or is it, uh, are, are, do you think people will fight? Um, so what, what, are the, what are the games tomorrow? So, so the, the, the pairings are Caruana. Uh, Caruana, Grace Chirv, they will play. Uh, Giri Alexenko. Yeah, Giri will play. And uh, uh, Ding against Nepomniachi. I that, that might uh, might just be a, a draw. And then yeah, MVL against Wang Hao. Uh, probably they will play. I, I could imagine that. Uh, no, I could also imagine Ding is is playing. Um, mm. But yeah. Um, but maybe without the great, uh, great gusto. Um, but eight and a half points is is good before the final round. Of course, Nepomniachtchi. If you made nine and a half, there will be a new record. I think Kawana won with nine in Berlin. Plus four. I'm trying, I think that's right. Yeah. Otherwise, it was plus three. The other the other winners, or the candidates. So what what are the yeah, chances he, uh, Carlson, so. he he does the. Um, you know, he throws down the psychological gambit and tries to win tomorrow to, to prove his newfound resilience or something like oh, that. He doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't care. <laughs> I, th I think the idea that somehow they're trying to prove anything to anyone else, uh, most of them are not, not yeah. caught up in these things. Uh, um, too bad. It would make for a good story. As, as I said on Twitter, I'm just excited because, uh, you know, Nepomniachi makes these fantastic faces. When he's when he's wherever he is, and and we're gonna have such a selection of great photos of him from this world championship match that that I I won't know I won't know which one to use. They're all gonna be so good. Okay, so Marcin is asking here. Uh, you said before you think uh, Jan is. Uh, I don't think Jan is the best challenger for Carlson. Why is that, and how many chances do you give him? Um. So the reason why I don't I don't think he's the best challenger is because he is quite a superficial player, and you can see this also in his play in this tournament. Uh, whenever you have had a moment where you have to play deeply, um, he he doesn't do it. 
but also to, to an extent, a lot of his opponents don't do it. And they do play a lot of rapid these years. And I do think it's uh, it's not just the, uh, the with the the online uh, year or, or nightmare, whatever you want to call it, we have had. It's also uh, a lot of these um, tournament in, in the tour before were uh, transformed into rapid chess because I don't know, for some reason, they believe some people care more about it. Um, and I don't think so. I don't think the data is there. Uh, that because it goes faster, people will sit and watch it nonstop. I think actually when it goes slower and people are dipping in and out and much more interested. Um, but I'm not from the marketing department, but I, as a coach, I can see that that will tend to drive you towards very intuitive uh, decisions. And there are some players who, who do this in general, um, Carlsman, Geary, uh, especially, um, but they also, uh, in Carlson's uh, case, he's also able to shift gears. Um, for the match, I do think that the Carlson team will have learned a little bit from their experience, and they will come with decent preparation with White. Um, I do think they're going to come with the, the same mistake, the same mistaken attitude as they did against Kayakin, which is we have the better player, we will win. We don't need a strategy against kayaking that almost went wrong. I did tell Motulev that that was what they were going to do. And that was the problem because when it's not working, then Carlson would get frustrated and exactly what happened. But there we should point out that I think for in terms of the maturity aspect, I think Carlson benefits much more from that than Nepomniachtchi. I think he's much more uh, mature uh, and has matured a lot and his attitude will be much more professional and he will be much more focused on playing well to win rather than deserving to win. Um, so if we look at uh, Carlsen today and we look at Carlsen um, when he won the title in in 2013 and especially when he defended the title in 2014 you know it's, we see there we see a, a, a like a grown boy and now we see a, a man a strong man he's a very very different uh, character and for me that puts him as a big favorite but i also think that you know the the team behind uh Nepomniachi, uh some of them are also people who worked in the kayaking team and uh, I would I would assume Motulev is included in the team because Potkin and Motulev are very close childhood friends, and uh, they're all friends with Nepomniachtchi. And Potkin is, of course, uh, Nepomniachtchi's uh, coach, and has been for a long, long time. Um, I do agree with with Dirk that uh, the main point is that the the challenger. Uh, is the one who wins the tournament because that's sport. It's not uh, pundits get to choose the challenger. Um, but this doesn't mean that there isn't their best challenger uh, in terms of who would have given Carlson the, the most difficult match. I think Kawana playing a match for the second time would have been the most difficult opponent. Carlson has said the same and more or less every other uh, talking head you can find on YouTube these days have said the same. Um, but I do like the fact that things are decided not by talking heads, but by uh, games played on the board. Um, I do want to say another thing about Carlson, though. Uh, today he had a, a picture on Instagram uh, where he's standing with a chess book and saying, uh, be a student of the game. And uh, it took me about two minutes to find the exact page he was reading. What book was it? Uh, Positional Decision Making in Chess uh, by Boris Gelfand, which obviously I wrote uh, based on conversations Boris and I had. And the game he was looking at was the, the page he was looking at was 108, 109, which is the end of the game, Boris Gelfand against Magnus Carlsen. <laughs> so uh, Moscow uh, 2013. And, and how much did you have to pay, pay uh, play Magnus for that product placement? 
Well, I'm still waiting for royalty check for uh, them using our my book in the in the prop. Oh, uh, I see. I see. Yeah, it's like a fair trade thing. Okay, I get it. What does Nepomniachtchi need to do to have any chances against Carlson? Uh, Robert asks. Um, well, first of all, he has to not do what Kayakin did, which was spending six months on uh, on Russian talk shows and enjoying a short term celebrity, which was horrible mistake um that celebrity will also be there after the match especially if you win um and with kayakin apparently thought there was one time uh, <coughs> a one-time uh, event um so yeah th that's the first thing to do prepare very seriously for the match start now um I do think it's very important for him to be uh, really, really prepared for playoff because we have seen before many times that these matches have a tendency to end in the playoff. And the reason for that, and this is something that needs to be fixed and Fide will not fix it. But the reason for that is um, in the World Championship matches historically, uh, when uh, the score has been tied, you have a drawing percentage of, I think it was 23, uh, I read. But when it's not tied, you have a, uh, no, a, a chance for the game to be won at 23%, decisive games at 23%. While if the score is not level, you get at 46%. The players will have a, a very different approach to playing chess. And we've seen it in the World Cup many times, and we're going to see it in the World Cup again in, uh, in July. And we see a lot of matches where the players are nervous. So theoretically, the players should be willing to fight uh, because they can realize, oh, my chances in a playoff might not be very good. Topalov took those risks against Anand. But we've seen in an overwhelming uh, instance of the cases that the players will defer the moment of uh, consequence as much as possible. Uh, and it's bad for the game. And that's why we have had, uh, in World Championship matches, we have had uh, so many of them go to a playoff. I think it's like four since they introduced it. So, uh, or is it? F so, Kramnik and Tupalov was the first one with playoff. And that was a playoff. Uh, and then Kramnik was not playoff, and then Topalov was not playoff, and then Gelfand was playoff, uh, and then uh, Carlsen was not playoff twice, and then we had uh, and then Kayakin playoff, and then Kawana uh, playoff. So um, we, we need an end in the match. That's basically what the conclusion should be from this. He's only got 20% chance of a playoff, but uh, Carson's got 50% chance. So what's the solution then? Um, we need to simply uh, do what FIDE always does in the presidential board. They overrule the the decision of uh, of the tournament and they just install an end as a challenger. That's the solution. Oh, you mean the solution like structurally for... Yeah, um, I mean, I, I was okay, going to... I, I thought I, you were I, saying it was problematic to get Anand as a challenger. No, um, no. I, I was just going to say the champion gets draws, but I mean, if you want to be much more radical, that's... Well, I, I have a number of solutions for you. Uh, so th there are many of them. Um, one is uh, that the uh, champion gets draws. Uh, another one is that the champion gets draw-offs, but you play 13 or 15 games, and the, uh, no, not the challenger, the champion gets draw-offs, uh, but you play 13 or 15 games, and the challenger is white in one more game. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense if you want draw-offs. Uh, another argument is that uh, the challenger should have draw-offs because uh, the champion has not been doing anything to deserve the title for the last few years. I, I think the challenge. I think the the champion should be uh, earlier in an earlier stage in the tournament. I, I don't understand this idea with uh, the champion waiting for two or three years and not not doing anything to defend the title. Um, but also there is uh, the very oft mentioned uh, suggestion of having the playoff 
before the tournament. Mm. Everyone says that, you know, oh, the play of such great excitement. Yeah, it's one exciting day after 12 uh, overwhelmingly dreadful days, usually. Uh, so if it's so great, why not take it on day one? And then we can make the 12 uh, uh, days uh, better. And you can throw in a blitz uh, playoff as well and, and something else. Uh, you could have a, a thing. So Brian uh, has two, two remarks here. The first picture, question mark. Um, it's not first picture. It's not first picture with Magnus holding a book from our company or that I've written as far as I remember. Um, and, and Brian also saying the champions should get draws. For, it's just for an me, opinion. Is, yeah, for, for me, this is uh, what I call the Ric Flair theory of, uh, of chess. For, for those of you who are not wrestling fans, uh, Ric Flair was perhaps the greatest professional wrestler in the history of the game. Uh, Peter Lecco, I know, would agree with me on this because it turns out uh, Peter Lecco is a gigantic wrestling fan. Any rate, uh, Ric Flair was wont to say that to be the man, you've got to beat the man. And I think that's right. If you want to be the champion, you have to beat the champion. Um, it worked, you know, for many, many years in, in the, the great series of, of tournaments that were uh, championships that were run by FIDE. Uh, I don't see why this, this very neat, very clean uh, solution doesn't just solve our problem. Uh, you know, for me, I, I would prefer to get rid of all the rapid yeah, I can, stuff. I can ex explain it a little bit, and I can give you some uh, some his history to it. So, first of all, you know that the, no one really knows for sure, but the theory is in the Schlechter Alaska match that Schlechter had to win with plus two to take the mm -hmm. title away from Alaska because he was plus one last game and he had draw and he didn't take it. So why not go back to the, the old tradition of you have to have plus two and you have to organize the sponsorship yourself? Like, you know, the, the history, history argument doesn't do anything for me. So the point of, of the draws was in a 24-game match, the, the, there is time. You're not going to have a 24 game match. You're going to have a 12 or 13 game match. So if isn't you want to do the champion draws, then do it. Do it at 13 games. But wh why this this uh, bumper sticker argument? Why has this any value? It's a bumper sticker ar argument. It's a. It is no more uh, valid than claiming Elvis is still alive. He's not. Well, of course, Elvis is still alive, but people say I couldn't say that. <laughs> um, no, it's true. I mean, his, you know, an appeal to history is not really an argument. But for me, um, you know, we, we appeal, at, appealing to a, a history where um, essentially world champions have affected the. Uh, the rules of the world championship in a way that we today consider quite, inap uh, quite inappropriate. Of course, now we have uh, this bizarre situation where we have a, a world champion who organizes the tournaments. Um, for surely, I don't think, I, I don't for a moment think he would do anything unethical, but he would uh, be able to uh, uninvite players if he said so. He would be basically a way to able to manipulate the rules if he says so. He owns the journalism about the tournaments. He owns uh, publishing the platforms, uh, all these things. Yes, it's only 10% uh, he owns, but... Uh, you, you keep the talent happy. You, you don't do things to, to, to well, anger the, the face yeah, of... We, we, we see that there's some situations where we get these borderline things. So, for example, if you go to a feeder tournament and you play king e2, king e7, king e1, king e8, you're just dismissed. Prearrange the draw, you're out. So, so this is the first question. Like, are the arbiters uh, able to, to be fully uh, independent when the player owns the tournament and, and pays uh, for the arbiter? And, and we all know that that's not the case. The second case is when he uh, suggests this to his opponent that they should make a draw, a uh, prearranged draw, does the player have the same amount of uh, ability to say no 
<laughs> when his opponent decides who is invited. And obviously, the answer is no. Now, do I think for a moment that Nakamura would be uninvited, that, um, that there's anything very bad going on? No, but it, it does create a bad situation. And now we have a situation where Chesapeake are the sponsors of FIDE, the world champion, one of his companies sponsors the ruling body. And Carlson at the same time is coming with public statements that he wants to change, he would like to see the change of the, the, the format of the world championship. And it's Un, unnavigated, unnavigated waters, unprecedented. Oh, no, we, we, we have been here many times before. We had but Vinny. Well, but, but none of the well, was, but was well, changing the rules and Fisher changed the rules and then didn't play. <laughs> he didn't get it exactly as he wanted. And uh, and but it's it's different when it's a you know a nation state like the Soviet Union as opposed to uh, a private equity company. And somehow it feels I think different it's to me. Natural progression, isn't it? Um, a very different argument for a very different show. Yes. <laughs> um, but for now, the World Championship match will be as it was. And. Uh, Well, the real question is, will it go to 12 games or will it be decided I think, earlier? I think it's 14, isn't it? Are they going to make it 14? I thought I thought that I have not I... read the rules. OK, I, I mean, I, I, I could be wrong. For some reason, I think 12 was... was too short. Yes. And, uh, and 14 is too short and 16 was too short. And 20... I, I agree entirely. I, 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 you know, my first world championship match that I saw was the 1990 match. And, and uh... oh, you young people. Yeah. That was uh, that was quite a barn burner. I don't know my first was 1984 slash 85. Yeah, and so not, not entirely unprecedented what we saw here this time. But. So um, I think tomorrow we are not going to make any epic uh, prediction. Ashvin is confirming it is uh, 14 uh, rounds this time. Uh, we're not going to make any epic uh, predictions tomorrow. I think I will just alone go through the games from the final day and uh, I will send you a game of the day again. And where can you find those? That would be at uschess.org. And uh, if you look in our categories uh, on, the, on the archive, if you click on the, the candidates category, you'll be able to find it there uh, with beautiful PDF versions of Jakob's annotations that I slaved over in InDesign to get them to look right. And uh, PGN will be downloadable and there will also be links to every one of these YouTube recaps. So yes. you can get the whole shebang. Good. And, uh, Perfect. Thank Jakob, you, John. Thank you. As always, it's a pleasure to talk to you and uh, glad everybody tuned in to check this out. Um, I'll see you at the opening preparation camp. Thank you very much. And that is on killchesstraining.com. And uh, the camp is from Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, four day camp. And it has uh, his head coach is uh, Sam Shanklin, who will be doing one hour every day. And then he'll be doing an additional three hours on the last day. And then I will be there. And uh, Nikos Dielis. Uh, well-known and respected opening uh, expert will be there and our uh, uh, beloved in-house coach, in coach, Renier. And uh, I think it will be, uh, uh, it will be good as always. And uh, if I'm told correctly, it is cheap as always. Uh, I think it's uh, 99 euros and- uh... so, yeah. Which or if, is, you, uh, if you sign on as a yearly member, you get it for free. By the way, just so you know, everybody hears this. I'm. This is not a paid plug. I I pay my membership fees just like everybody else. Well, it is paid. You pay me. <laughs> that is the payment that is going on. Yes. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's. Um, I'm excited to see what everybody's going to come up with, and uh, yeah, lots of good uh, presentations. I'm also very excited what I'm going to come up with. There you go. Get some. Get it for free. I'm already already quite well prepared. Um, but I will still use uh, some hours throughout the week to, to look at it. And I look forward to see, I know a lot of you in the chat are going to be there. And if there's anyone else, you're, you're very welcome uh, at killsestraining.com. It's a happy place. We're really uh, 
uh, have a very nice thing going and uh, you're very